Hello, JJ. Well, hello, Natalie. You know, it's not very common that we record in the afternoon. And I don't want to say that we only do it for people we especially like, but... Well, I think I might have put in a special call and said, can we do this afternoon so Natalie can't sing? Oh, (laughs) that's really hurtful. I mean, I'm not going to lie to you. See, Ali, our wonderful guest, doesn't know that I sing on the podcast because we record early morning. But I will hold off on singing, although I might hum a little. (laughs) Ali, you are so blessed. That's all I can say because she always, always sings. So (laughs) Always singing. We're moving on. I'm going to introduce our guest. Let's talk about Ali. Okay, Mm -hmm. so we always say for this series, because Ali is part of our male caregiver series, Mm -hmm. we have a boy on today. We have a boy. Most caregivers are female, so we have another male caregiver today, and his story is fantastic. So we are happy today to have with us Ali Amadi. His caregiving journey started, he says, years ago when his mother-in-law was diagnosed with a serious illness. He and his wife didn't think twice when they brought her into their home, but they weren't quite prepared for what the issues were going to be. They thought just moving her closer to vital resources and services was going to fix everything. So Ali says the stress and new obligations quickly started to take a toll, but he found something that changed everything. And today he's here to tell his story and how a protocol called T-Care changed his and his family's life. Ali, we are so happy to have you here with us today. Yay! Yes. Ali, we are here. We are super happy to have you with us. Um, And so um, I think normally where we start, and JJ always laughs at me because I'm like, okay, start from the beginning. You were born and then push all the way up, but don't do that. Give us a little bit of background about you, your wife, kind of your the family. Give us a little bit of background and let us know uh, what, give us a little bit of background. Yeah, so um, thank you everyone. Um, um, having um, my background started out when I uh, uh, joined the U.S. Navy and was flying Mm. Uh, as a aviator for several years and um and you know life was uh uh challenging uh right after 9 11 uh when uh there was a lot of deployments and um met my wife got married uh and um we had a pretty uh happy life uh background uh aerospace engineer trained by the greatest organization in the world, the U.S. Navy, uh, to, uh, to navigate extremely difficult situations in my life and make a, a split-second decisions. Yeah. And, um, and our world was turned upside down when um, we found out my mother-in-law was diagnosed with stage 4 uh, lymphoma cancer and... Uh, we essentially became what, what is now known as caregiving, which at the time, uh, caregivers, which at the time we had no idea what it meant. How, so how old were you guys then? Like how far into your marriage? Like, give me a little bit more detail. Like, I feel like I'm talking to Jason a little. Jason's like, here's the basic details now. I'm like, no, go a little further into it, Ali. A little more. A little bit more. We're women. Yes. Um, Married uh, 18 years when we found out mm. um, about my mother-in-law. Uh, we um, it was, yeah, um, we were 11 years into our marriage. Wow. Um, just had uh, a new baby, uh, oh. our, our firstborn. Mm. Um, okay. Uh, took us a while. Um, and at the time, uh, Ethan, our firstborn, was uh, two years old. Mm. Did your mother-in-law, was she close to you all where she lived at the time, or did you move her from far away? Was she close? No, um, she was living in Miami at the time, and uh, she moved to St. Louis, Missouri with us. You said in your biography, you said you didn't have a hesitation. It was just kind of a, of course she's coming to stay with us. Is that just something you and your wife had at some point discussed, or was that just because family Mm -hmm. is that important? You just said, there's no question, of course she's coming to be with us. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I grew up in a family that um, I was born and raised in New York City and uh, grew up in a family that uh, we had a lot of family members surrounding us and um, everywhere, but um, had amazing relationship with my mother-in-law. Um, and it's the only parent my wife has known. She's uh, She lost her dad when she was a uh, toddler. And so... Um, her mom has been a pillar in her world and um, and was in ours as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, very much supportive of uh, all the direction in life that we've uh, gone. And so when we found out about the news, um, it was it was a it was a not even a split second decision. It was like she's coming here. We're taking care of her. We will find the best care. Um, and um and you know having a two-year-old at the house along with taking care of um a cancer uh patient relative it's uh it was we didn't even know what the term sandwich generation was 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 mm -hmm. at the time but mm -hmm. it was just learning that it was uh interesting mm. so were you still in the military at the time uh no no uh i was actually at the time going through business school at mm -hmm. Washington University in St. Louis, um, getting my MBA and uh, and working a, um, at the time I was a nuclear energy, uh, nu nuclear engineer for uh, Siemens Energy um, and uh, doing a lot of international nuclear projects. Uh, I was traveling a lot internationally and um, doing consulting work at the time on site. So with that, I asked uh, at the time my employer Siemens to transition my role to more office-based rather than field-based um, so that um, I could be there at home with my, uh, with the family. Yeah. Go ahead, Jeff. Well, I, and there's a first curiosity here. Siemens is a, a, a incredibly large company. Yeah. At that time, Ali, was there any type of caregiver program or did they did you even mention that this was so you could help care for your mother-in-law or was this uh, just a i'm gonna need a little extra time like what's your supervisor in hr yeah. say yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh no the term <laughs> wasn't even wasn't even uh, uh known at the time no um yeah global fortune 100 company yeah. um and no at the time there was no care there was child care right back sure. care support but no caregiver support. Mm. And to my knowledge, still, I don't think there is. Let me ask you this, because you said you asked for basically, respect, respectfully, a desk job. Like, yes. get me somewhere where I can be home. Even I, I'm still willing to work my 90 hours a week. I'm just able to go home at night to sleep there, yes. as opposed to sleep elsewhere. And so what did your supervisor, did you, well, what did your supervisor say? And did you take a pay cut? Um, I did take a pay cut. I was no longer doing field work or international pay or um, I transitioned from a union engineer to a desk job uh, engineer and lost a lot of benefits, lost a lot of pay, but um, it didn't last long. Um, okay. Three months in, having the challenges that we had gone through Three months in, I knew I had to start something different and help families that were going through similar situations. Hmm. You know, you had said that you thought that just getting her closer to the resources and maybe the the resources, the health care that she needed would be, that would be it. That would be plenty. But what you found out was that you actually needed to be at the house because that's where the care was, Ali. That's where you really needed the help. Is that what you and your wife found? Was your wife there a lot more than what you anticipated, both of you? Yeah, so a uh, couple of weeks into the diagnosis, we um, I was telling a friend of mine how much um, challenge we were going through. Mm -hmm. And uh, he suggested that I meet with his mom, which was a... For 30 years, she's been a sociologist, gerontologist researcher yeah. at University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee. And, um, uh, and, and he said that his mom had created this 
clinical protocol mm -hmm. um, on how to help caregivers uh, in their journey. And so very reluctantly, I was like, all right, sure. At that time, I we'll take any help. I'm just grasping at the walls. I'll take any help we can. And um, got introduced to the research team at the university. And um, they put us through this clinical protocol known as uh, tailored care, which is now known mm -hmm. as T-care, mm -hmm. um, that would measure stress and depression in caregivers, and then um, that would measure the emotional and mental impact of caregiving. Mm. And then along with the assessment of the care for mom, mm -hmm. um, it would, through different decision logic, it would make some recommendation and suggestions. Hmm. Um, so we went, my wife and I both went through the protocol and um, at the time, what we thought we needed in our caregiving journey was we needed home care, we needed adult daycare, some services, some uh, cancer cancer um, education. That's what we thought we needed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When we went through this protocol, essentially what the suggestion in our care plan that came out was uh, in your support plan, you guys need marriage counseling. And it was a little odd to us because I was like, this is going to give us recommendation for my mother-in-law, mm. her care. But it ended up opening up the eyes of, it is part of mother-in-law's care that you too stay sane in your marriage and have a stable household. And with the challenges that are ongoing, um, you need to solidify that. And so not only it identified that, but it identified three blocks away from our house, the local church that Saturday morning does free family counseling sessions, made that referral into that. So not only it allowed us to understand where we are in our journey, it made us realize a resource that what we didn't even know we needed or didn't even think about. And then it actually connected us to that free local resource. But what was interesting is, and one of the biggest areas of how it helped us, this clinical protocol is anchored on a theory known as the identity discrepancy theory. This is the transition of identity when a son or a daughter starts transitioning into the identity of caregiver Whereas in early stages of caregiving, I'm 90% son, 10% caregiver. Towards later stages, I can become 90% caregiver, 10% son. This identity shift that one goes through is what leads to a lot of the burnout factors and a lot of depression and stress among caregivers. Um, and I never knew a lot about this, this theory until the first time I had to bathe my mother-in-law. How it wasn't the physical act, it was the emotional impact that that had. Um, that you have to switch off being a son and turn yourself into caregiving mode. Yeah. But then afterwards, once you've stopped com compartmentalizing the emotion, the impact that that has is what leads to that high burnout factor. And so I was just fascinated with this clinical protocol and the science behind how to quantify caregiver support and actually caregiver's burnout and then algorithmically how to bring a uh, scientific protocol based on 15 years of longitudinal data, mm -hmm. how to actually identify root cause of caregiver support versus just the tactical support that is out, out there. Mm, okay. I'm going to pause us right there. 
because this is getting really good. <laughs> but I'm going to take a break just for a second, and then we're going to come right back. Jay? I don't know about you, but my inbox is always cluttered with useless emails. But there's one I always open, the Confessions of a Reluctant Caregiver newsletter. You may say, Natalie, what makes you so special? Well, I'm biased, but don't just take my word for it. Here's what our subscribers say they love. First, it comes once per month, and you can read it in under five minutes. Next, you'll find amazing tips and resources to use in your everyday life. And who doesn't love a recommendation? These sisters do, which is why we share sister-approved products and discount links to save you time and money. And of course, you're first to know about the upcoming month's confessions. Just like our show, you're guaranteed to relate, be inspired, leave with helpful tips and resources, and of course, laugh. Go to our website, confessionsofareluctantcaregiver.com to sign up for our newsletter today. Hey, everybody, we are back here with Ali Amadi. We're talking about the T-Care protocol, and we're in the analytics, I'm telling you. We're, we're talking about... I just, I, we're talking about compartmentalizing. We're talking about turning on a caregiver, turning off a son role. I, Natalie and I are intrigued because this is what causes burnout. And I think that's what so many of us, male or female, need to realize. Ali, do you feel like if we can recognize that, that's kind of the purpose so that we can, and we can't eliminate it, I don't think all the time, but it helps us to lessen it? Um. Yeah, it's 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 not so much about lessening the impact. It's about coming to terms with it. Coming to terms with the emotional impact versus reducing it. It's understanding that when dad is asking the same question 10 times over and over and over and over and over again. It's not actually dad that's asking that. It's the disease of dementia that's asking that question. And you're coming to terms with it. It's coming to terms with my wife and I are struggling in our marriage. It's because of the impact that she is struggling with the identity of being a wife, being a daughter, and being a caregiver. So... It's, it's not so much about reducing the impact. It's understanding and coming to terms with it. Mm. Wow. I could see that, though, Ali. I mean, when you think about the mental health field, um, and I know we've strayed a little bit away from your story, but we'll get back there. Yeah. Um, but in thinking about understanding the why, the hardest thing for me was to accept that I could be two roles at once that was non-traditional roles. So it's it's normal to be wife and daughter or, you know, um, mother and daughter at the same time. And your wife at that point had four different titles because she was mother, wife, daughter, caregiver. Correct. And so, and, and if, and she's putting on a hat. She's like a nonprofit at that moment. <laughs> like if that's what people will be like, oh, I wear multiple hats. But it's the caregiver piece that I think that we're so unfamiliar with that we think that the roles that are within the caregiver kind of definition are roles that occur within the other or are tasks that are in the other roles definition. And so I think that's why most people don't see themselves as caregivers until I think after you've entered it, you don't go into it thinking, oh, I'm going to be a your caregiver today. I'm going to switch my daughter hat. Yeah. Yeah. Caregiving is, is, is known as the, the hardest job that you never volunteered for or accepted that you were never prepared for. Yeah. Um, and um, it can be uh, extremely challenging, but also rewarding as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I want to back up just a little. So your mother-in-law moves in with you and 
what was your biggest kind of like, like you're thinking, okay, my mother-in-law is going to come in. I think there's probably some things that you're thinking automatically. We're going to help with doctor's appointments. We're going to help with this. What were some of the things that were unexpected that you can look back now and be like, dang, I didn't, I didn't realize it's going to, I was going to have to, or my wife was going to have to do this. Or my wife is away. A lot of the things I hear is, my attention, my wife's attention is not on me. And I'm not talking about just a husband. It could be a child. We've had children talk about feeling like I lost, I didn't have the time I wanted with my mother because she was caring for her mother. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, it was, it was a lot of uh, unknowns because first when she first moved in, we we're like, all right, we'll get the care. We'll figure out the cancer, we'll figure out the treatment plan, and this will be all be done in a few months. Yeah. Um, that was seven years ago, by the way, and to this day, uh, seven years ago, we were told she had six months. Mm. To this day, she's still with us, living with us. And Wow. Um, so, but the journey just goes on and on. Um, and... Uh, a lot of the unknowns were less about the tactical care and more about bringing all the community-based services and the social services and understanding and trying to navigate all the benefits or, or I mean, the biggest challenge was how to navigate Medicaid and Medicare. Oh, a hundred percent, friend. <laughs> Like it's, 100%. I'm 110 on you there. You know, I, I, I often say I was, you know, again, I'll repeat it, trained by the greatest organization in the world, the U.S. Navy, to navigate myself out of really difficult situations as an aviator, make split-second decisions, troubleshoot on the spot, on the fly and figure out difficult, challenging tasks. Uh, never so lost until I had to navigate Medicare, uh, <laughs> Medicaid. And um, it was just such a spaghetti mess designed to confuse um, by nature and um, it just baffled me that I considered myself somebody smart, but I was the dumbest idiot that couldn't figure out how to navigate our healthcare, our healthcare system. And as advanced as we are in the 21st century with all the AI tools, all the technology, all the algorithms out there, nothing was out there to help us. Yeah. And there, that is... That's a really good way to put it, because I know that um, JJ and I, I, we always laugh about how many degrees we have between us. <laughs> and here's the worst part, Ali. I mean, with Jason, I worked in the healthcare industry and I had a hard time navigating that. And I'm like, I'm an executive. I know how to navigate. I know all of, I know what expect to expect. We're the healthcare to experts. Yes. You can figure this stuff out. Exactly. And so I think, I think that's so important to say, like, we have to make it easier. And you almost wonder if and I, it does feel like the system is set up to reduce cost. Um, I won't say see us fail, but um, to be cost conscious and because there's barriers for sure that will keep people from applying. Like somebody literally just said yesterday morning when we were recording with Paul, actually, he said um, hospice stopped. And when his mother was eligible again for hospice, he could he decided that he didn't want to apply for it because the paperwork and the administrative burden was too much. And he was like, I'll just deal with it. Like, that's a problem. <laughs> like when you administratively burden people from from doing it. And I think that's where, you know, even I think about what you're doing now with T-Care itself and where we'll get there, you're removing the barriers for caregivers to provide the best care to the people they, they love. Right. Um, 
it's there are a lot of great organizations out there to help. Um, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of help out there. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of community based, faith based, nonprofit based, you name it, organizations out there. But there's a single there's not a single centralized area to go look for help or even know where to look for. Mm-hmm. Um, I, yeah. I think that's what we hear the most, Ali, and is that people, if you don't ask the right questions, you won't get the answer. And I think that's where the frustration with so many falls because there is help. You just don't know where to go get it. So, yeah. so let me ask you this. You're, you you come into this is very interesting that your your mother-in-law is, is still with you. I mean, you've got these doctors and their infinite wisdom saying, well, your mother-in-law's got about six months. And in your mind, you're like, oh, that's because that's hard to process. But then there's also the back of your mind. You're like, well, we can you know, you can almost do I can do anything for a short window of time. I do that when I'm working out and there's only like 20 seconds left. And I'm like, I can hold that plank. <laughs> like, And all I want to do is put my knee down. <laughs> That's what I feel like some days were for caregiving for me. I'm like, I don't, I think there's going to be an end. I'll hold that plank, right? It's painful. Mm-hmm. It's uncomfortable. I don't like it, but I'm, I know I'm like, oh, I'll be better for it at the end. What ha- as, as life keeps going on, how does the relationship evolve? Your, your, I, I say this respectfully, your mother-in-law keeps living and she's still doing treatments and she, which is great, but she's still living with you. Is that correct? Is she still with yes. you? Yes, yep. absolutely. Awesome. And I like that you say absolutely because that feels so good. That feels it, really good. We've and, uh, we've come we've come to terms in how to manage caregiving, how to manage the stress, manage the treatment plans. Um, it's it's not easy, but it takes a village. It mm. Does and when you don't have a village surrounding you. It's how to bring those resources and support in place that we've we've been blessed to find, you know, as we started T Care years ago. It's just learning and learning about different resources that are in the community. I think it's interesting when you do recognize yourself as a caregiver and you start kind of identifying like you're like, okay, I'm a caregiver. And you're like, Oh, I check this out. And you start doing searches and you like a little, like a little door opens and it takes you down these like little rabbit, little, these rabbit holes. <laughs> and so you're like, Ooh, and it's very easy. I always, we always, JJ and I always say, for goodness sake, don't go to the internet because honestly you'll get sucked in and, and hours oh, later and you still haven't found anything. Mm-hmm. So no, it just directs you to, it becomes a, 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 a just a non ending circle. Yeah. 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 And so, so you and your wife are caring for your mother-in-law. Uh, would you say that you all are equal share? Is your wife taking the lead and you're still trying to work and you're trying to manage? And um, I would say we are equal in, in that regard. Mm-hmm. Um, we have two boys, uh, 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 Ethan and Eli, eight-year-old and two-year-old. Um, and um, we, uh, we share our duties between... I would say I'm more of a caregiver to mother-in-law as she's more uh, a mother to our uh, two boys, but then it would switch between us. Yeah. That's interesting. And you've got boys. So you're role modeling to your sons about caring for others and that gender does not impact should not impact your ability. I'm to writing care. this down. Natalie said, "Bro modeling." <laughs> role modeling. Ali is role modeling. Bro modeling. Yes. Bro, Bro modeling. modeling. Oh, I love that even better. <laughs> Bro model. I'm I'm jotting that down. Ali, you work. I mean, what you do is you work with caregivers. So, do you see? We the reason we developed this series is because male givers, male caregivers, are really underrepresented. We feel like. <laughs> Do do you see that in your business? Do you see different impacts with the burnout, with ways that they can respond? What I mean, you're one. I mean, obviously, when somebody comes to you and says you need marriage counseling, I think as a, if I were even as a female, I'd be like, "What? My marriage is fine. My mom's yes. driving me crazy." So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. it is our mom's fault. It's exactly. My mom's fault. Yeah, my marriage is great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
there is definitely differences in how both in the tactical and emotional support. Mm -hmm. Um, And I I could give some stark differences. Um, uh, Male caregivers tend to first jump into looking for resources as a more as a financial caregiver. Um, Less on the emotional caregiving side. But when you start actually supporting them, specifically through our uh, our identity discrepancy clinical model, mm-hmm. um, what you realize is male and fail, uh, male and female caregivers equally share the equally get impacted by the emotional impact of caregiving. Yeah. Uh, they might be less prone to support or less uh, prone to showing it externally. But the impact is, is the emotional impact is equal. Now, um, in our second or third follow-up um, support uh, uh, assessments that we do that every 45 days uh, that we update our support plan, the, the caregiver support plan, um, typically every four or five days, or unless we have an inbound, hey, I need a support, I need this. Um, We work with a lot of employers um, uh, out there bringing this to their um, workforce, bringing family caregiver support to their workforce. Um, And what we realize is there's definitely a gap between the expectation of if the condition becomes that stark that one has to become full-time at home for caregiving, there's definitely a gap between is the male going to take time off of work to be at home or is the female taking time off of work? Regardless of the pay gap between them, actually. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So um, we see a lot more female employees going on FMLA um, leave than male. Um, Again, non-correlated to the pay difference or or compensation difference, which has been interesting to see. Um, The other thing that we see is, that's noteworthy to talk about is there's a lot of misconceptions about different cultural norms when it comes to caregiving. Okay. Whereas different cultures approach caregiving in many different ways. Of it takes a village, mom or dad. They are since when we are born, are conditioned that mom or dad will live with us. Um, in in some cultures and others that are uh, a little more independent. Um, what we see in the 15 years of longitudinal data in over um, half a million caregivers that have been enrolled in T-Care. Um, and this longitudinal data, what it shows is regardless of age, race, um, or religious affiliation, the emotional impact of caregiving is universal across all cultures. The tactical elements of caregiving can be different, Mm -hmm. but the emotional and psychosocial impact when we measure stress and depression among caregivers is universal across all cultures and all ages and all religious affiliations. Okay, I'm going to stop you right there because I need to take one more break. I am completely leaned into my microphone right now. I know. We'll be right back. Hey, ladies, I need to interrupt for just a second to share about the Sisterhood membership. It's basically a sale every day. And the best part, it's free. Here's the details. We're partnering with our friends at Benefit Hub and other care partners to save you money. With over 200,000 participating companies across the U.S. and abroad, you'll find discounts at your favorite local stores, huge savings on vacations, amazing deals on home, auto, and supplemental insurances, and everything in between. Go to confessionsofareluctantcaregiver.com to sign up, and then definitely tell your friends about it. They can join too. 
trust me, there's a discount for everyone. And don't forget, it's free. Okay, back to confessing. Hey, everybody, we're, we're here with Ali Amadi, and we're talking about the emotional impact on caregivers, that it does not matter any demographic, male, female, I think we, we talked about ethnicity, that it doesn't matter. Yeah. And I mean, we could show the data that talks about this, that um, tactical changes uh, in different gender gaps are, are, are different. We've also measured this in our data in the LGBTQ community and see mm -hmm. different patterns and trends there. Mm -hmm. uh, T-Care, we have rollouts with also numerous native tribes um, mm -hmm. in, the, um, in the Older Americans Act, what's known as the um, Title VI programs under the mm -hmm. native. Um, um, there's the, when mom gets diagnosed with dementia and starts having cognitive issues, regardless of what cultural background you come from, that impact that it has on identity discrepancy is transitioning between I'm a son or a daughter to now a caregiver. We have not seen in our over uh, half a million dyads of data sets any patterns um, in uh, the different tactical support, the, the different emotional support that are out there. So with that, we brought numerous um, cultural adaptations, not just translations, but cultural adaptations culturally adapted programs in how we educate, train, and support family caregivers. Every family is different. Every family, every caregiver is impacted differently. But 90% of the emotional impact is universal. I think that's the thing for me, Ali, is that it's why we talk about um, we don't just cover aging population. It's chronic, complex, disability, and I would include mental health and substance use disorder because those individuals, your, your folks with serious mental illness, these folks also have caregivers. Most people have people who love them, right? And that while the reason for care is different from person to person, there is a common thread that goes across. And I think you're right about the it's the emotional piece and i that's why i said reluctant caregiver there's a reason we named it confessions of a reluctant caregiver the, the reluctance is not because i didn't want to crawl under the stall to get my mom out of the nastiest walmart in in, in north carolina it was <clears throat> but it was it wasn't that i didn't want to but it was just all the emotions and feelings and thoughts that i would have that of i'm not good enough I'm failing my mom. All the baggage that you bring, that you have in your past experiences that you bring alongside of you with that person and that that person could inadvent, in, uh, inadvertently trigger you and you that's when you see outburst. That's when you see you get to this burnout. And I think you guys really try to address that uh, caregiver burnout. To, to do really preventative things through service provision and recommendations and things like that. Tell us more about, tell us more around that. I just, I just think it's so interesting that, that you guys are seeing, you've got data to validate what everybody believes. Yes. Um, the data does not lie. Um, it tells us a story. It tells us a narrative. Um, it's 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 amazing to see not just in the um, diversity of caregivers, but the diversity in the type of caregivers. For example, um, when we rolled out with for T care with the caregivers of the aging population, um, we knew our protocols, we had our algorithms, we we got a specific organization that said they also want us to create the module for caregivers of special needs children, not just aging parents, mm -hmm. the IDD population, the intellectually developmentally disabled 
the IDD population. And so we started working with caregivers that were parents of special needs children. Um, and then we expanded beyond that. We had one large enterprise uh, insurance company that carried risk on foster ch children's um, health. And uh, so through them, we created the actual module for preventing the burnout of foster parents. Um, which actually, that identity discrepancy is, is even a lot higher when it comes to that pop population. Hmm. Um, and then um, we partnered with an organization called DAV, Disabled American Veterans, mm -hmm. and specifically rolled out to their 1.2 million membership uh, the 1.2 million membership based of DAV of family members that are taking care of veterans. And it doesn't have to be disabled veterans. Any veteran, whether the caregiver is a veteran or the care recipient is a veteran, doesn't matter. The families are eligible for this. And, um, and it's just been very, very interesting to see the different diverse impact that we are delivering while the clinical model of the identity discrepancy, that secret sauce behind what we do, has stayed constant. Hmm. I, have a, I have a problem, Jay. <laughs> yes? <laughs> We're close to the end. And I'm like, oh, I know there's so much more. This has been, this is, a, this is different from our normal. I'm going to tell you, Ali, this is different than our normal conversation. I think this is really important because it validates it, what I keep hearing is like, one, it happened to me and I thought, I've got to do something. You took your skill set and then you took this, this, you took T care and you've made it into this huge thing to support caregivers and giving and really helping caregivers identify proactively the things that they need support with, but even the things that we don't even know we need. And so I, I think we're going to have more information about T-Care and all the links and that sort of thing so folks can have it. But it's it's time for sister questions, Jay. I am ready. So first I of think all, it's, time. it's not really an accolade, but Ollie, there I always say there are things that I learn. And there's something that we talked about earlier, which my question was about eliminating my burnout. And you said it's not about eliminating. It's just about accepting not so much the burnout, but the work that I'm doing, just accepting that. I never looked at it that way. I always, and it's been years, but I'm always like, no, I can, I can do more and I will feel better. I never thought about just saying, that's good. Just JJ, just accept the situation and let's go forward. So thank you for that. Um, I guess my, a big question for me is I know there are a lot of people that are going to hear. I love how focused um, I feel like T-Care is on identifying and working on prevention. But if I'm someone out there and I know we'll have all the links, just tell me something that I could do to learn more about T-Care other than it. Is it open to the public? Tell me about that or how someone could inquire yes. about getting this. Um, one, if you are a military veteran or taking care of a military veteran or have a veteran in your household, you are 100% eligible for free to enroll in T-Care. Awesome. Just go on DAV.org or on the tcare.ai website and put your contact in and uh, we'll take it, we'll take the rest. Now, others, you can ask your employer if they are offering a caregiver support program. Mm -hmm. If not, um, have the appropriate person or yourself go on T-Care, T-C-A-R-E dot A-I, T-Care dot A-I, and uh, fill out our contact form, and uh, we'll get in touch with your employer or uh, um, and see if we can offer support to you. The other aspect is um, if you are on Medicaid, if you're the person you are taking care of, your loved one, is on Medicaid, uh, we are currently in, have a footprint in 47 states. So wow. most likely uh, we will be able to uh, help you. And so just go on tcare.ai, tcare.ai, and uh, 
fill out the contact us form and we'll see if we can help you. If not, go to your uh, employer and say, you definitely need tea care. Yeah. Well, I, I totally agree. Cause I think, I think if you're, especially if you're employed and you're not a stay at home and um, you're a full-time caregiver that way, I, as an, as a person who was employed while caregiving still is, but really hot and heavy, like Jason was hot and heavy in the middle of his chemo and everything. I found work to be a beautiful distraction to give me an element of normalcy and the illusion of control during a period that I had no control. I think that's the biggest thing. It, work allows me to be like, I can control this. I'm good at this. I'm winning. <laughs> yes. And and so I think that's so important. So my question is a little bit more different. My question is, because I know how much you work. We have met, we met last year and, um, and now the whole military thing, it totally all makes sense to me, Ali. Like I see it. I'm like, all I can think of is Top Gun now and you're going to have to get past that for me. <laughs> I can't, I like, and I'm like, da, na, 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 na. I you said, I you singing that as well, like Tom Cruise. I started okay. immediately I singing see. that song in uh, my a, head. A couple of more pizzas in my belly, not as good looking. Uh. <laughs> but even Tom Cruise can't do Medicaid. So, I mean, he, I'm going to tell you right now. All hey, he can't Tom do Cruise did not figure out how to navigate Medicaid. <laughs> That's going to be in our reels. Tom Cruise, we know you're, you're as tr in trouble as we are. But I know that you are working full time, you are caring for wow. your wife, your sons, your mother in law, all the people because these are your employees. So they might as well be family too. you're caring for a whole lot of people. And then those you serve. What do you do just for yourself? What do you do? What's your guilty pleasure? What do you do just for you? Um, well, there's episodic and then there's there's uh, um, consistent. Okay. Um, I hit my midlife crisis uh, point this past May and uh, went to Nepal and had to hike Everest. And so uh, one, one of that, one of my areas of disconnecting, my wife was absolutely supportive. Yes. Um, I go on a lot of hikes and I constantly have to challenge myself. So uh, summited Everest in, by this past May, uh, wow. but that's more episodic as far as uh, consistent, um, I'm a runner. I love running. Um, and my, my, uh, way of disconnecting and shutting it off is, uh, is running and, uh, spending some time with my, my boys. I love that. that. Those are the times where when I'm with my boys or running is my only time that I'm able to truly shut it off. I love that. I'm so glad we're friends, Ali. Even if you like, you have no free will. I'm like, you don't have any free will. I'm your friend and Joe's. And so, <laughs> thank you so much, Ali. The no information, kidding. The, and I am a statistical numbers person. So I love that you're like, no, this is not like just hearsay. It's not about just all these random reports. These are facts. And I love mm -hmm. that. So if you're a caregiver out there, don't think that it's just in your head. These are actually facts. Um, oh, if you want to learn, if you want to nerd out on numbers, we could do this all day long. We can, <laughs> we've you, seen Holly. how, on average, we delay or divert nursing home placement by 21 months and enabling aging at home by 21 months. We've seen that uh, when families have to spend money out of their pocket prior to eligibility for other services. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, especially female caregivers, 42% of their retirement savings, 401k or other savings are drained because of taking care of aging parents. 14% yeah. um, reduction in Family Medical Leave Act, uh, FMLA in the employers that we are serving. And so we could go on and on in, uh, in nerding out about numbers, but um, it's, it's amazing that when you bring preventative support to family caregivers, how it impacts both the caregiver's health and the care recipient's, the patient's health uh, as well. And the, 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 the return on investment, the ROI does not lie. Nope. That's right. And there's some things that you can't even measure, which is the personal, the, you know what I mean? There's some things that are so even better than the numbers, because those numbers are very impactful. And, right. you know, and again, I know, um, I just want to thank you for coming on, sharing your story. I, I am 
I am so happy that your mother-in-law is still with you and that she's like, yeah, let's, let's, I'm going to, I'm not done yet. And that the support of you and your wife. Yeah, exactly. He's a fighter. Had, every, every time I think I don't have the will or I get demotivated or anything, I, I look at her and I'm just fascinated by her fighting skills. Oh, I love that. Well, guys, thanks so much for listening in and we will catch you next Tuesday when we confess again. Bye-bye. Thank you.